In this Jordan B. Peterson podcast, Dr. Peterson speaks with therapist Sarah Stockton about identity, gender dysphoria, and her experiences with gender-affirming therapy. Peterson and Stockton discuss how identity is not just internal, but also involves one's relationships with others and with transcendent ideals. Stockton explains that she had been involved in transgender specialty teams and had contributed to the transgender assessment used to assess readiness for hormone treatment, but became concerned about the developmental readiness of children being taught about gender identity. Stockton shares how she became involved with Matt Walsh's documentary on gender dysphoria and gender-affirming therapy after a client sent her a clip of Walsh on Dr. Phil, and how this impacted her life. She also shares her educational background in psychology and marriage and family therapy. The podcast goes on to discuss the importance of delving into the underlying issues related to gender identity. It is noted that simply stating that one feels like a certain gender without exploring the reasons for it is not enough. The host gives an example of his son playing dress-up in feminine clothes with his sister's friends, and how this gave him insights into the need for young children to play out fantasies related to gender identity to understand the opposite gender. It is suggested that without the opportunity for such play, a child's understanding of their own gender identity may be impacted. The guest shares a similar story about her son playing with dolls and how it helped her to understand his views on gender. The conversation tackles the issue of gender-affirming care and the contradictory messages in the API guidelines and the unhelpful suggestion that choosing to accept a trans child is better than having a dead child. In this portion of the podcast, they talk about the lack of long-term studies on the mental health effects of gender transitioning. They note that while there is a claim that early transitioning has mental health benefits and reduces suicide risk, there is no valid evidence to support this. The conversation then delves into the broader topic of psychopathology, specifically the nexus between depression and anxiety. Dr. Peterson notes that there are many reasons why people may experience intense negative emotion, including biological factors and cultural issues. He mentions the historical phenomenon of hysteria and how it was a culturally defined pathway for women to express their misery. Dr. Peterson also highlights the existence of psychological epidemics and how they tend to affect pubertal girls more than boys. He argues that the recent explosion of gender dysphoria cases is another example of social contagion. In the next portion, Sarah Stockton discusses her past experience as a therapist and her concerns regarding the rise of gender dysphoria diagnoses in children. She notes that during her training, the percentage of male to female patients seeking treatment for gender dysphoria was much higher among adults as opposed to children. Stockton suggests that this finding contradicts the idea of a psychogenic epidemic, which some proponents of the gender-affirming approach argue is not a new phenomenon, but rather an increase in the acceptance of a previously suppressed group. Despite an acceptance of gender-affirming therapy among a portion of society, rates of sexual experimentation remain unchanged. The conversation then turns to the consequences of the medical interventions involved in gender-affirming surgeries. Stockton notes that no medical diagnosis other than gender dysphoria would result in similar medical interventions in children, and that many therapists are not prepared or trained to discuss the full extent of the consequences of these surgeries with their patients. Peterson expounds on this, noting that the consequences of bottom and top surgery can be catastrophic, and that many individuals and children do not fully understand the implications of these surgeries. For example, during the construction of a penis, the victim's arm may be stripped of its musculature leaving nothing for a 5-inch segment except bone covered with skin, which can result in the patient having a dysfunctional penis equivalent. The consequences are not limited to sex organs. Stockton says many children undergoing gender-affirming surgery do not understand that they may lose their functional reproductive organs. Finally, Chloe Cole's experience is relayed as an example of the issue of breast reconstruction in gender-affirming surgery, with her double mastectomy at 15 being called a cardinal act of unforgivable malpractice. They go on to discuss the issue of gender reassignment surgery performed on minors. Sarah Stockton argues that minors should not undergo this surgery because it involves the removal of healthy body parts, such as breasts, which can have negative effects such as the inability to breastfeed. Additionally, the removal of nipples destroys the erotic potential of the area, which can have a major impact on a person's capability for pleasure. Dr. Peterson adds the perspective that different professions can attract different types of people and that professions like surgery can attract people with lower levels of empathy or even sadistic tendencies. He also brings up the issue of greed and profit in the medical industry where there is a lot of money to be made from performing these surgeries. They both express concern that this decision can have a long-term and deeply traumatic impact on minors and that individuals who undergo this surgery may try to rationalize their decision externally, which can become pathological. In this segment, they discuss the phenomenon of Munchausen by proxy, a situation in which a parent fabricates or induces illness in their child for attention or personal gain, 
Stockton describes a case she encountered in her practice where a mother exposed her child to an adult male who was autogynophilic and dressed up in lingerie, as a way to display the mother's moral virtue. Peterson notes that this behavior is an example of Munchausen by proxy, and wonders if therapists are trained to recognize and address it. Stockton states that she had to learn about the syndrome in her practice, and that in the case she encountered, the child may have been taught to believe they were trans instead of actually feeling that way. Peterson notes that in some cases, a narcissistic and immature mother may look for reasons to explain any disturbed relationship with her child, and may believe that having a trans child would confer status and attention upon her. He gives an example of a Disney executive who claimed to have a trans child and a pansexual child, which according to his calculations would be a 1 in 9 million probability, leading him to question the motives behind the claim. Peterson explains that therapists are now often mandated by law to provide gender affirmation care, and that this has led to a difficult situation for parents who are facing distress on the part of their children, and may feel pressured to accept a diagnosis of gender dysphoria even if they are unsure or uncomfortable with it. In this portion, they talk about the psychological epidemic that is occurring with an obsession with identity. The majority of this epidemic is happening to white Caucasians, and Stockton notes that this was also true with anorexia and bulimia. Peterson speculates that perhaps the link with dysphoria is that radically unconstrained freedom is destabilizing, using the example of a child given too many choices in their closet. The problem with the radical liberal subjective whim identity theory is that people are drowning in possibility, and it's difficult for them to determine who they are when they are told they can be anything they want. This leads to confusion and excessive experimentation that can lead to dangerous behaviors, such as furries or human sacrifice. Stockton notes that these behaviors can be linked to pathologically suppressed pretend play, which is rebounding inappropriately through virtual forums or sexualized behaviors in adulthood. Overall, they conclude that we do not understand these issues well and more research is needed in the field. In this portion of the Jordan B. Peterson podcast, Dr. Peterson and his guest Sarah Stockton discuss the field of gender transitioning and the related practices of informed consent and therapy. Stockton advises therapists to give informed consent to patients about the potential risks of undergoing gender transition procedures, such as the possibility of requiring lifelong antidepressant medication or developing cancer. She also criticizes the lack of honesty some patients have with their physicians regarding their assigned sex and the potential harm they may be causing to themselves. When questioned about why she has chosen to speak out about this issue, despite the potential risks and backlash she may face, Stockton explains that she is doing it for the benefit of children who may be affected by these practices. She expresses her concern that intervening at a young age may not be the best outcome for them and advocates for parents to seek second opinions before proceeding with medical procedures that could impact their child's life. Stockton highlights the importance of not only questioning the practices and ethics surrounding gender transition, but also having open and honest conversations about the potential consequences and implications of these procedures. Peterson praises Stockton for her bravery in speaking out about this issue. Sarah Stockton goes on to discuss her experience working on a transgender team during her undergraduate studies, where she was trained on body and gender dysphoria and assessed patients for their readiness for medical transition. The team was tasked with evaluating if early intervention medically could lead to better outcomes for transgender individuals, which entailed assessing children and their families to see if they understood the implications of starting hormone blockers or hormone replacement surgery. Peterson and Stockton discussed the age of the patients they were assessing, which tended to be in their 30s to 50s, and the possibility of earlier intervention for individuals with gender dysphoria. Peterson brings up the differential diagnosis and the two essential manifestations of transsexual orientation, one of which is late onset and related to autogynophiliacs who tend to dress up for sexual reasons, and another related to children who develop body dysmorphia or gender identity trouble early on, and tend to be diagnostically distinct from the former. Stockton expressed that she was not introduced to the term autogynophilia until later in her own career, and shares an anecdote about one of her clients, who had his penis amputated due to a desire to have body integrity disorder. Sarah describes her experience working as a therapist with children who have gender dysphoria. She cites a particular case in which a patient requested to have their penis amputated, which led her to realize the complexity of gender dysphoria and the need for multidimensional assessments. Dr. Jordan Peterson emphasizes the importance of avoiding oversimplification and moralistic judgments when dealing with such complex issues. He also brings up the case of Ken Zucker, who was driven out of his position as a gender dysphoria expert by gender-affirming activists. Dr. Stockton explains that she developed an interest in becoming a therapist because of her comfort with discussing uncomfortable topics, particularly relating to sex. She also explains that she was able to relate to her young patients through her own experience of having a medical condition that is not necessarily visible from the outside.
Dr. Stockton and her colleagues developed an assessment process that looked at various domains of early childhood behavior and familial relationships to get a fuller picture of the patient's gender dysphoria. They also note that the cases they dealt with in the past were mostly presented by concerned parents rather than by the children themselves. They go on to discuss the intricate and difficult process of assessing and treating children with gender dysphoria. Stockton expresses her concerns about the lack of discussion on key domains such as physical, sexual, and school histories, as well as future expectations of the child. She notes that in the past, children understood that they were transitioning to a specific gender, but now it is treated more magically where they can simply identify as the gender they choose. Furthermore, Stockton mentions the challenges of assessing children with body dysmorphia, as there are many possible reasons for its development. She highlights how parents can be a driving force in pushing their children towards gender dysphoria out of a need for compassionate attention. Additionally, Stockton mentions how autistic children may struggle to conform to the typical gender roles and may be seen as more male or thing-oriented in their thinking. She emphasizes the importance of careful diagnostic analysis before suggesting any form of treatment, and notes that a one- to two-year assessment with weekly meetings would be minimally necessary. However, now, the standard is only three sessions, which she believes is insufficient. Lastly, Stockton brings up the issue of people wanting to get hormone blockers or hormonal treatments simply because they have access to guidelines, without taking the necessary time to fully understand their condition. The lengthy, often painful process of assessment and introspection may exacerbate the situation temporarily, but it is essential to understanding the complex familial pathology driving the child's gender dysphoria. In this portion of the podcast, they discuss the collapse of the one to two year diagnostic and assessment process for individuals experiencing gender dysphoria. The pressure from clients to get started with transitioning, as well as the push for efficient and cost-effective diagnostic processes, is causing this collapse. One example of a lack of thorough assessment is provided through the story of Chloe Cole, a detransitioner who was put on the gender transformation path without ever having anyone walk her through the basics of what was wrong with her. She underwent a double mastectomy at 15, which left her with irreparably destroyed breasts and a completely masculinized voice. The focus has become more about following a set pathway of hormone blockers, surgeries, and electrolysis rather than treating the underlying gender dysphoria and addressing any potential trauma associated with altering one's body in such a significant way. Stockton also raises concerns about the dissociative and detached manner in which transitioning is often approached, without adequate attention to trauma-informed care. In this portion of the podcast, Dr. Peterson and Sarah Stockton discuss the issues surrounding modern-day conversion therapy particularly in relation to gender transition. Dr. Peterson notes that Tehran is now the world's capital for gender transformation surgery because the molas have decided that being gay is not acceptable. The consequence of this decision is that individuals who are homosexual are now encouraged to identify as the opposite gender and have sex transformation surgery. Peterson argues that this should make us think long and hard about the ethics of gender transformation surgery. Moreover, he argues that the notion that hormone treatment and surgery are going to be an easier route forward for those experiencing gender dysphoria is an indication of insufficient diagnostic and assessment practices. Stockton discusses the complexities of the issue from a therapeutic standpoint, noting that there is a mandated gender-affirming stance for therapists, which is an alarming transformation in therapeutic care standards. She also notes her concern about new terminologies such as dead name, which normalizes suicide and is dangerous. Additionally, she describes how people are identifying as animals or lamps, and trans-ageism is becoming prevalent. Moreover, she points out that by calling gender transition a way to correct someone's past, we are altering history, forcing people to conform through punishment, and valorizing the idea that we can alter the past by force. Peterson's guest, Sarah Stockton, discusses the concept of identity and how it has been simplified to subjective whim by psychotherapists and the left. Peterson argues that identity is a complex, multidimensional phenomenon that is influenced by one's group affiliation, social surroundings, relationships, and biological and physical elements. He believes that reducing identity to something internal and subjective is a consequence of the derailment of a liberal Protestant ethos of self-actualization, which places emphasis on the individual over the community. Peterson and Stockton agree that this reduction of identity is troublesome for individuals who are confused and at risk of defining themselves in a way that is not sustainable within a social community. Stockton expresses concern about the lack of ethical treatment practices in her profession and suggests that the medical community needs to be more informed and transparent about treatments for gender dysphoria, as well as acknowledging the biological and physical aspects of identity. She also shares an anecdote about a child's perception of gender transition, revealing a lack of understanding about the biological realities of sex.
In this part of the conversation, they discuss the confusion and disorientation that can arise from the current trend of teaching children that gender is a social construct. Peterson argues that the difference between male and female is fundamental and biologically determined, stating that the notion that this is somehow a social construct is so delusional that it's almost it's it's surreal. He emphasizes that the difference between male and female is a perceptual category that has emerged over hundreds of millions of years, and that confusing children on this issue is extremely harmful. Stockton describes a conversation she had with a school psychologist, in which she inquired about whether misgendering would be considered a form of bullying. She expresses concern about the practice of affirming a child's gender identity solely based on self-report, without considering the potential long-term consequences of these decisions. She argues that children need more information and that simply telling them to follow their feelings is not a sufficient approach. Peterson brings up the issue of the American Psychological Association's guidelines for diagnosis, emphasizing the importance of using multiple techniques of measurement before formalizing a diagnosis. He suggests that focusing solely on self-report is not scientific and that clinicians need to consider a variety of factors before making a diagnosis. Overall, the conversation highlights the complexities and controversies surrounding the issue of gender identity in children, and the need for further research and discussion on this topic. I and this portion of the podcast, Dr. Jordan B. Peterson and guest Sarah Stockton discuss the importance of using objective measures in clinical diagnosis rather than solely relying on subjective self-evaluation. They use the example of diagnosing anorexia if only subjective feelings were used as diagnostic markers. The clinician would have to conclude that the patient is indeed fat when in reality they are severely underweight and at risk of starvation. As clinicians, they are trained to use multiple methods of measurement, including self-report, well-validated objective questionnaires, behavioral logging, and information gathered from family, friends, or professionals to ensure diagnostic accuracy. The conversation then shifts to discussions about gender dysphoria and how it has been treated as a choice rather than a severe pathology, which discredits the beliefs of trans individuals who view it as a mental illness. The hosts also express concern over the confusion created among children with the current ideology that one can switch their gender at will, without any objective measures or analysis of what it means to feel like a boy or a girl. Dr. Peterson stresses the importance of detailed analysis of what exactly one means by such subjective feelings in order to ensure diagnostic accuracy, and ultimately, strive for the truth. Check out the full podcast by clicking the link in the description below. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. Thank you for listening to this podcast summary episode of The Pod Slice.